So it's really hard uh, to introduce a person like Haywood Samuels. And I've thought about this a lot over the past few days, and I decided that uh, the best way to do it would be to start with a brief anecdote. And, and you might remember this, uh, Woody, so tell me if you do. I first met Dr. Sanders uh, five years ago, almost five years ago to, to the day, uh, a couple months from now, uh, when I was a very nervous job applicant interviewing in the midst of a severe economic recession for a, an assistant professor position here at UTSA. Now, of course, I had come across his work as a graduate as a graduate student, his work on convention centers and urban politics. Uh, so I was a little bit awestruck, I, I should say, when I first interacted with him. Unfortunately, though, at least for me at least, that first interaction occurred during my so-called job talk uh, in front of the department faculty. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with, with, this, uh, with this term, uh, the job talk for, uh, for academic positions is really sort of the make or break moment in the interview process, the point at which you can either win uh, or lose the job. So I was already uh, pretty nervous to be in that situation. Well, after delivering my, my presentation, uh, Dr. Sanders, as only he can do, asked me a series of extremely probing questions about my research that all but left me crumpled in a ball on the floor. <laughs> Now, I can laugh about it because I got the job, but I, I honestly left that job talk feeling like I needed to go back to the drawing board with my research, feeling like uh, my most significant weaknesses had been exposed. So, needless to say, it wasn't really my finest hour. Uh, never got a chance to thank you for that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, since then, I've actually come to realize that, that my experience with Dr. Sanders really wasn't atypical. In fact, I've come to know that that dogged commitment to getting right to the heart of things that was surely in evidence at my job talk is really one of Dr. Sanders' hallmarks as a teacher and a scholar, something that is certainly on display in his new book. However, since then, I've also come to know a much kinder and gently uh, and gent <clears throat> gentler Woody Sanders. A person that is deeply committed not only to his research and teaching, but also to engaging robustly in public affairs and mentoring and supporting students and beginning professors like me. I've also come to know uh, a lot more about Dr. Sanders' impressive career in academia. Although he rarely mentions it, Dr. Sanders trained at two of the finest academic institutions in the world, Johns Hopkins and Harvard Universities. After receiving his PhD in government, don't worry Woody, I'm not going to tell him the year. Okay. <laughs> after receiving uh, his degree at Harvard, he held positions at Brown University, the University of Illinois, uh, the Brookings Institute, and Trinity University here in San Antonio before accepting a full professorship here at UTSA in 2001. Over the years, Dr. Sanders has developed an outstanding reputation as both a teacher, a researcher, and an uncompromising public intellectual. As the students and alumni here can attest, his jaw-dropping course on San Antonio politics and policy is one of the most popular classes that we offer here at UTSA. And his research credentials are just as impressive, if not more so. If you take a look, and I did this last night, if you take a look at his very, very long CV, you'll see that he has co-edited several major books on urban politics and policy, along with more articles than I can even begin to count uh, on issues such as urban economic development, infrastructure, and the rough and tumble world of urban politics. More recently, of course, Dr. Sanders has taken an interest in the politics of convention centers in urban America. And that's what led him to write this book, Convention Center Follows. Now, I don't want to give away too much of this because uh, Dr. Sanders is going to speak to you next. But let me just give you a very brief overview of the book and some of its many accomplishments. Published this past June by the University of Pennsylvania Press, which I would add is one of the world's leading academic presses, Convention Center Follies exposes the often shadowy people, institutions, 
and forces behind convention center development in the United States since the 1950s. At the core of the book is an argument about how political deal-making, an unhealthy obsession with downtown development and land values, and a revolution in the world of local government finance led to the privileging of convention centers over more pressing public investments in things such as schools and infrastructure. Through probing case studies of Chicago, Atlanta, St. Louis, and other urban centers, Dr. Sanders reveals how public officials have pursued a narrow development strategy centered on downtown over economic development projects that will provide greater benefits to the public at large. As historian Roger Biles said of the book, quote, Sanders describes in rich detail how policymakers have made convention centers key elements in their efforts to revitalize ailing central business districts and why the billions of dollars spent on the enterprises have yielded such meager results. Dr. Sanders, the publication of this book is truly an outstanding accomplishment, one that I hope will reshape the politics of public investment for years to come. So congratulations on the accomplishment. And now in recognition of this major achievement, and in honor of his continuing contributions to the areas of urban development, public policy, and public administration, I'd like to welcome Dr. Haywood Sanders to say a few words. And I had no idea I left you in such a... <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, and <laughs> colleagues and students and friends. Thank you all for being here today. It means a great deal to me. It, it's, it's, it, it's feeling like a retirement party, but it's, it's not. It's not. They have to come back on another occasion while I'm still alive and busy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a big book. <laughs> it's got a lot of pages. Don't expect to read it all in any great period of time. But if you want to subject yourself to it, I think it has an interesting story to tell. But I can't look around this room, individually and collectively, without recognizing the, the debt I owe to, to pretty much all of you. There's a, a lengthy acknowledgment at the beginning of the book, and I thank appropriately thank all the all the librarians and archivists and folks who provided the resource material that this, this book is based on. And I thank those colleagues of mine who suffered through it and gave me some feedback and pressed me to be better and clearer and indeed briefer, difficult as that may be. <coughs> But I look around here and I realize in a great many ways that this book could not have happened without here and this place. And by here, I mean in many ways this building, uh, the environment that, that Chris Reddick and Joe Reyes and Karen Metz and all of my colleagues have created here that, that makes this a place that is warm and supportive and genuine. And that's really important. And seeing the number of former students and current students who were here today just just warms the dickens out of me because it means in some peculiar way, exit papers notwithstanding, <laughs> we're doing something right. Okay. But there's a larger message here as well, uh, and it's a message that I, I never learned, I mean, despite all those lovely names, it's a message I never learned in grad school. Uh, and that I don't think many of my colleagues ultimately learn once they're out and, and looking at the world. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a message, it's a set of lessons that I don't think I could have learned any place other than San Antonio. 
And those are lessons about how things really work in a city. Because they work here, and I'm willing to argue work in a great many other places, in ways that are fundamentally difficult to understand and frustrating and peculiar, I can't help but, but look at, uh, at Sister Gabriella and think back to the days when the most important thing we needed to secure this community's future was a multi-purpose convention and sports affiliate. <laughs> and that would be Henry Cisneros Alamo Dome. And we got that. <laughs> And I would never have embarked on this effort <laughs> were it not for seeing how that dome was sold to us <laughs> and what it ended up meaning in the end. Uh, and that lesson, and the lesson of who's here in this community and what they need and the distance between what we need to do for folks here, everybody here, and what we end up doing in a lot of ways is what really propelled this research effort forward uh, and kept me at it for, for, unfortunately, a great many years and far too many pages. So for that, I thank all of you. I, I really do. Uh, because it's, it's you who, who taught me these lessons. And every day, uh, from what I see here and the folks I interact with here, and what I do with our students, <coughs> that teaches me even more that same set of lessons. So really, I mean, this means an enormous amount to me. It's, it's, it's really grand, and it's just great to see you. So come and drink and be pleased. And, and I won't lecture you about the dumbness of convention centers, especially not when we're spending $325 million down the street. Yet again. So again, thank you very, very much. It, it means a great deal.